Chernobyl. It took me about six months to arrange it, and it was an awakening to the problem that was just overwhelming. And this two-week story turned into a two-month endeavor because I couldn't leave. It changed my life. It changed what I wanted to do. It was so immense in its implications. There was so much damage to so many people in so many different ways. My first reaction was that I was looking at a different race of people because the damage was so incredible. She's about nine years old. When she got there, she cried all the time. She was an orphan. No parents, no brothers, no sisters, nothing. But the nurses were wonderful to her, and then she fell in love with the place. And now she's so happy to be there and be with these people. And when I saw her, she would make the rounds and cheer up other kids. And for me, she's looking out and saying, these are my people. Look at them. It's a great mystery to me. Of course, I couldn't talk with them, and they couldn't talk with me. But they're playing. They get along. They seem to have very active interior lives. They don't run around a lot, but they're very active internally. I don't know with what. That boy's not reacting to the people around him. He's acting to some interior call. A little boy on the bench, he's bound, not because he's bad and mean, but because if he isn't controlled that way, He'll sometimes start chewing on himself until he starts bleeding. The boy in the wheelchair was terrified. He isn't reacting to me. He did that all day long. He'd go through a phase. He'd sit in his wheelchair, and he was kind of contemplative. And he'd start getting agitated, and he'd start wincing and groaning and going through these contortions of horror. And then it would settle down. And he'd spend a few minutes looking relaxed. And then it would start up again. It was unrelenting. Little kids on the floor, they'd feed them, dress them, and put them out in the hallway. And they'd roll and moan all day long. What's wrong with them? I don't know. He had cancer, and the mothers are there behind him, wondering, What has nature wrought? A lot of the kids are given up to the state as soon as they're born. Can you imagine trying to bring up a child like that? You're very poor. How do you do it? But also, if you turn the child over to the state, well, then you no longer have any responsibilities to it. They would take care of it. It was like a different race. Kids on the floor, they can't walk. They don't walk. They roll. They crawl. They slither, they eat on the floor. They're like pack animals. Those are kids in Novinki. They're well taken care of. The nurses are fine, the help is fine. They're not brutalized, but they're in this institution which is part of a mental institution. They're not educated. They're given no lessons, no training, except staying alive and taking care of yourself but they're not looked upon as even viable human beings. When they become adults, they'll just be turned over to the mental institution, and that's where they'll spend their lives. There are four boys, and they're playing with themselves. Why that picture? They're young boys, the hormones are working, all that stuff is working. They're gonna be making love to women someday. They're going to be having children. What kind of genes are they passing on? It's a horrible thought. They say the radiation, different forms of it, can last up to 24,000 years. How many generations is that? Some of the doctors told me they thought there would be no more Belarus people. This will wipe them out. Is that true? I don't know, but they felt it very strongly, and they were afraid. His mother told me a very interesting story. She said, do you remember Vova's closest friend? I said, no, I don't. I said, well, he died 
He was very bright. He kept asking his mother in the last days, and he's saying, Mommy, Mommy, why am I dying? Why am I dying? He says, Chernobyl, Chernobyl, what else could it be? Chernobyl. And she told me that story in front of Vova. And I look at Vova in that photograph. Vova knows he's dying. She said that in front of him. I don't know why. Was she preparing him? She was born with terrible birth defects. And I was photographing one of the nurses who took care of her. And then this woman came in and took the baby. And she held her and was crooning and talking to her. And the nurse told me that that was her mother. And she comes almost every day and stays for about an hour or two. The kid doesn't know her. And every day she comes to be there. And every day she knows she doesn't have a daughter. Her daughter doesn't know she has a mother. Allah, Saint Allah, in the picture with this boy and that terrible tumor. She would hold him and love him, she said. Sometimes I think I love them more than my own children. I guess it would take saints to survive in that situation. She's getting ready to bathe him and see that incredible, grotesque growth. All I know is his kidneys are in it. I don't know anything more than that. And all with the boy with the brain outside of his skull. The mother holding her child, no hair, chemotherapy. We all know what chemotherapy is for cancer. I kept wondering about the mothers. Do they blame themselves? When I saw him, my thoughts were, oh my God, he's a monster. And he was. And his body is distorted and bloated. He has no lymphatic system. And I photographed him anonymously with two of his buddies in this hospital. And it's grotesque. It's unbelievable. It's inhuman. How could we have let this happen? It was an accident. It was an accident. People who make these things say, it's all covered. We've taken care of all the possibilities. Everything human beings make, wear out and break. So his body doesn't work properly, and his body is poisoning itself. He was an amazing kid. He was full of life, full of energy, really bright, inquisitive, ran around, played games, very outward and open. If he's all dressed up, he's this great kid, handsome, really intelligent, sparkling eyes. And he's a monster. How's he going to live? Alessia had spent six months in the United States getting help. So she spoke some English. So I spent most of the day with them and just getting to know them and talking with them. And then they said, well, come back tomorrow. I went back the next day and went into the room with my interpreter. And Alessia and Sasha were absolutely paralyzed with fear and anguish. Alessia was in a coma. And they were just in agony. And it looked pretty hopeless to me. And I asked, is it OK if I photograph? When I asked that, she said, yes. I want everyone to see what they've done. And Alicia spent the day moaning and begging, pleading to God, my daughter, my daughter. The pictures are tough, yeah. A boy's brain outside of his head, yeah. It's tough to look at. Yeah, think of the mother, think of the father, think of the family. You think it's tough, huh? Look at Alessia. So she spent this day moaning and crying, my love, my love. 
my love, don't leave me, don't leave me, don't leave me, my love, my love, don't leave me, my life. When Alicia was three years old, she ran out to play in the black rains of Chernobyl. Someone asked Robert Oppenheimer, the father of the bomb, after the first explosion in New Mexico, what was it like? He said, some of us laughed, and some of us cried, and some of us fell silent. I recalled the Hindu scripture. I am become death, the destroyer of worlds.